Hi, my name is Nikki Emilike, CEO of Nisden College. Welcome to Centerpoint Africa with Nikki. This program is centered on education, international politics, and so many more. We're here to discuss an important issue that's been happening in Nigeria, and that will be our focal point today. So we have a panelist here, and I'll allow them to be basically introduce themselves. First, Edith, please introduce yourself. Hi, Nikki. Um, my name is Edith Wanchipo. Um, actually, I'm the director for Sample Services. Uh, I do, I'm an entrepreneur, basically, and also a politician. So these are, these are my focus point. Um, you know, but as the director of Sample um, Services, we are into financial advice and management consultancy and also give advices on insurance, loan, and everything that got to do with financial services. Thank you. Well, oh, thank you very much. Again, my second panelist, Ayo, or I call him Chief Ayo. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Ayo Akiva. I'm a journalist, author, and a public analyst. It's nice to be here. Well, thank you. Right. Can I basically start with Ayo? Yeah. Um, we something very serious is happening in Nigeria right now. Yep. And this is our focal point in regards to what we're discussing. Can you please explain to us what SAR means? Well, um, SARS means Special Anti-Robbery Squad. And it was set up by the federal government to investigate serious crimes and to arrest the menace of armed robbery across the country. That was the idea. It was a noble idea. It started off well. But unfortunately, what's happened is that because police are not well paid, they're not well remunerated, they live in terrible conditions, they, they became criminals. In fact, they became worse than the armed robbers. Okay. They would arrest young people, march them to the cash point, get them to withdraw money to give to them. They'd stop them on the road at gunpoint and force them to hand over valuables. And so SARS has become such a criminal, criminal part of society. It's no surprise that, you know, we have, we've had these protests and people calling for it to be disbanded. And, and bear in mind, they've also, be, they've also killed a lot of innocent people who've refused to hand over their money to them. Wow. So when did you think that the criminal activity started? Was it immediately? Because apparently SARS has started about 30 years ago. It's been like decades yeah. now. Yeah. And um, when did this criminality start? Well, there's always been an, a criminal element within the Nigerian police force, even before SARS was launched. Police regularly take bribes on, I mean, virtually every checkpoint, every police checkpoint in Nigeria is a financial center. You know, you get there, you have to hand over money or they don't let you go. So basically all SARS did really was just bring that into their operations. Now, what made the SARS situation more scary is that they were very, very heavily armed. They were given automatic weapons, much heavier weapons than normal police. They had bulletproof vests, so, and they were dressed in mufti, so they looked very scary. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, are you actually talking about the event that happened on the 20th, which is basically, or basically before then? No, no, in the run-up to that, I mean, we've had these protests going on for over two weeks now, where the youth following the, the killing of an innocent boy in Ugeli, I think he was actually pushed out of a moving car by SARS operatives yeah. because he didn't have any money to give them. And that's where the protest started. And it was peaceful. And for over two weeks, the youths all over the country were saying, look, dissolve SARS. We want police reform. We want more money given to the police so they don't have to extort money from us. And everything was moving peacefully until the government decided to forcefully end the protests. You know, they sent soldiers to shoot innocent protesters at Lekki in Lagos, and since then the country's been on fire. Right. Can I say something? How do, what proof do we have that, you know, the president had a hand in this? Or could we say it could be the, 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 the head of SARS that made the decision. Um, do you think that you know it came directly from the president? To be honest, nobody knows because we don't even know where the Ex president is. We exactly, have, nobody knows exactly I mean, what's happening. When's yeah. the last time we heard from President Buhari? 
<laughs> is he even in the country? Well, <laughs> is he alive? I don't know. That's okay. Honest, okay. Uh, in the terms of this, I think he's alive, <laughs> and we actually heard from him. Yeah, so I think what we need, once. we heard from him. So can I have um, edit? self boss to actually interject in exactly what we're talking about. What you saw on the 20th, can you please add to it, please? Okay. Honestly, um, that 20th, my, what happened, my heart actually, please, I, I cried. I won't lie to you. Mm -hmm. I was so, so disappointed with the government that I actually support yeah. because I'm part of, you know, I support this government. I support this particular regime. And when that happened, it became a very big shock to me over mm. what happened. Yeah. Um, SARS, they have started this protest peacefully, and I was happy that this process is, this process is going to bring revolution to SARS. Okay. And when it started, it was also ended when they did this protest. Okay. Within the first two days this protest started, the government mm. ended starts, in quote. It was actually ended. Okay. Um, because they still want to continue yeah. in order to make more impact. They of continue course. the protest until when some people started destructions. It was then when the destruction started with the protest that the government started to intervene with, in order to, ma ma yeah. to maintain peace and order because can, the protest can, can was I, peaceful. Yeah, can I add to what yeah. you're trying to say? The post protest was peaceful yeah. and immediately the government interjected, stated that they were going to stop SARS and everyone was happy. But however, the peaceful protest continued. Yeah. Um, so were they protesting for SARS now or were they protesting for something else? That is where, that is the middle line of what we're talking about. So so what do you think? Yeah, they, were, they continued to protest for SARS because yeah. they wanted to be sure it has actually ended. Okay. Yes. They understand. So I think that was why there was continuity. And they felt and they felt that if their voice could should, could be heard within that few days they started, more stuff should be added to it so that they can actually refer their anger in all that things that have been happening. We know that the unemployment, a lot of people are suffering, so they needed to put more pressure on the protest. So they, they still continue because when it started it wasn't all over the state. So the continuity was it to go all over to go national. Mm -hmm. I think. So then disruption started. I don't know mm -hmm. why they started, who, how it came about. I can't really say what I don't know because I don't know who started the disruptions. Some people claim there are thoughts that are paid to start to destroy this yeah. peaceful protection. So be, because that has started, though, what now happens is that the government has to take action. And the action they took is just to make sure that the armies are on the road to help those to stop them. So it started all in Lagos when they there is coffee, and and that's it. As of 4 p.m., the the protesters were still outside, and I think that's what triggered what happened. Okay, um, Chief Ayo, let me get to you. Right on that day, on the 20th, what do you think that really, really happened? Because um, we getting so many confused information in regards to the killings, you know. Um, at the moment now, I don't think we actually know how many people were killed. So, you know, just give us uh, your own point of view in regards to that specific date on the 28th. Well, I've listened to the Lagos State Governor, Dr. Jason Wolu, and he's been speaking at length okay. over the last two days. Yeah. And um, he's told us that his government actually extended the curfew till yeah. 9 p.m. to allow the protesters to leave. So it, if they were even going to call out the police to disperse them, it wouldn't have happened until 9 p.m. But these soldiers were there from about 6.45, I believe it was, right? And they just started opening fire. And now we've heard the brigade commander said he wasn't inf informed. He heard about it. He rushed there, and he found his men shooting. Um, there have been denials that, you know, even from the chief of army staff, from the presidency, everybody's saying it's an unknown soldier who gave the order. Nobody knows who ordered these policemen, to, these um, soldiers, to go there and start shooting. So the first thing I think we need is a panel of inquiry. Let us exactly. find out who ordered those soldiers. Where were their written orders? I mean, military, the military don't just deploy anyhow. There has to be written orders. Yeah. We would like to see them. And who signed those orders? 
you yeah. know. Now, in terms of the numbers of casualties, we'll be getting conflicting figures. But I'm going to go with the official figures published by Amnesty International. This morning, Amnesty International said they have evidence that 12 corpses were wow. carried away by the police, by the army, sorry. And, that, and Amnesty, Amnesty International has appealed to the Nigerian army to release those corpses for burial. We hear that one of those who was in hospital died. So if we add that one to those 12, that would be 30. Yeah. Um, I think it would be safe to go with that figure wow. rather than all this speculation. Exactly. Wow. That's right. So, you know, now, what is the progress now? What do you think? Can I start with Edit, um, Selfbox? Um, what do you think that should really happen right now? What, what is your own opinion in regards to now we've seen these fatalities? What should the Nigerian government be doing right now? Well, what they should be doing right now is to make sure that the investigation into the army who gave the order for the shooting should start, which I learned from the news that it has started. And once that is done, the next thing that will come in should be compensation for those families that lost their children. Mm -hmm. And after that, the way forward, we need the president to come out and address us so that we know what we to expect and what to do. So everybody is looking at for the president to come out to you know, address the nation, which mm -hmm. he has not done. So I'm looking forward to that myself. So mm -hmm. that should be the next step. OK. Yeah. Um, Chief Ayo, would also the same question goes to you. What do you think the progress should be? And what would the Nigerian government be looking at in order to sort this problem out? Well, first and foremost, I agree with Edith. We need a proper investigation. And, I, and as far as I'm concerned, this is extrajudicial case. If the president didn't authorize it and the chief of army staff didn't authorize it, whoever's responsible should be made to should be punished for it. You know, of course. there are international criminal courts and human rights courts to deal with this kind of abuse. I also want to see President Buhari come out and address the nation. I find it gobsmacking that two weeks after the protest, he hasn't had a, a nationwide address. He hasn't made a nationwide address to speak to everybody. It's, that's shocking. But more to the point, over the long term, the issues of SARS, the reform of the police, and police remuneration, that has to be done. Otherwise, we'll be back here next year. You know, the, the conditions under which some of our police live are just terrible. You know, the barracks, they're like sewers. You can't put people in those kind of conditions and expect them to police effectively. It's just not going to happen. Then lastly, the youths themselves, I mean, the police is one thing, but there's a whole range of other problems they face. Unemployment, insecurity, um, no opportunities. All these are socioeconomic issues that we need to address because something else will spark off another big protest next year. I also wanted to add, um, you know, we know there have been looters, there have been people looting, and there have been criminals, you know, burning buildings, and, you know, can you please um, add to that as well? Because, you know, why do you think that protesters just tend to really see their rioting where they're actually burning and destroying buildings? To be honest, the protest was very peaceful from day one. I knew it would get ugly the day I saw, was it Hussein Kumasi go on TV to say, hey, uh, due process hasn't worked. We are now going. To, we now need necessary process. As soon as he made that statement, the following day, we saw DSS and government officials ferrying all these thugs around in in public cars. They started beating up protesters, and that's when everything just went downhill. And essentially, what happened? We had the protesters, and then we had the hoodlums. You know, and then you know those who weren't the original protesters joined in, and then that's when we've got all this violence and chaos and burning of police stations, burning of bus stations. That wasn't part of the original plan. If the government had provoked this, I think we will, the protest will have remained peaceful. Can I say something? Is it the government? Hmm? That's another thing. Is it the government or is it the representative of the government? So we need to really be careful on literally who we should, like, say is the responsible for this because one thing I know is that the protest started and there was a lot of issues and a lot of a lot of things kind of went to from peaceful to a very bad circumstances. The same question goes to you, Edith. What do you think about the looters and also the people who have been you know, burning um, houses? Yeah, what do you think about it? 
Well, um, I've heard a of people saying um, they were paid looters. You know, they were paid to destroy the government, the peaceful demonstration, so that it's going to work against them. But right now, I think barely before the event of the 20th of 10, the disruptions of looting was to disrupt the peaceful demonstration that would have yielded good results. Now, were these people paid to disrupt this? Is what well, nobody can really say until after the investigations. I do, I do not want to speculate. Yeah. But on the other side of it, once there is protest like this, some mm -hmm. people who, some little toss that are hungry, we want to take advantage of it. So it could be that they weren't paid after all. They just felt that this is an opportunity to steal. It mm -hmm. happened in the US, we yeah. know that, when there was the Black Lives Matters. Of course. So it was peaceful. And then before we know it, some people start looting, start burning places, use that to loot. So yeah. it could also be the same thing that happened because these looters are hungry. Of course. They, they are jobless people. So they want to use that opportunity to, dis, to destroy peaceful. They were, it could be that nobody paid anyone to destroy the peaceful. Yeah. It just, the, the work of thought, that is what they do. They use that opportunity to make sure they gain something. And that might be what has happened with the case of Nigerian law. Thank wow. you. Right, thank you very much. Um, can I also ask a question? Now we had this problem on the 20th of just about a couple of days ago, and um, we have we heard from the international? <laughs> have we heard from the USA? Have we heard from the Europe? Have we heard from the leaders who are meant to be uh, a champion in peace for the world? I would want to ask you questions about this. Why, why do you think that you haven't had much from um, international leaders? Well, to be honest, Nigeria is no, not their priority. We're on the back burner. Whoa. But um, fortunately, there's a large Nigerian diaspora in the UK and the US who are pressing the government. I know on Saturday, for instance, there's going to be a march on Downing Street to get Boris Johnson to address the matter. Also, on the UK law, if you have a petition of up to 100,000 people sign it, the government is compelled to discuss it in the House of Commons. Yeah. Now, as of this morning, 177,000 people had signed it. So that is going to be discussed. But um, to be honest, the British government is so preoccupied with its Brexit problems, I'm not really sure they've got the time for it. In the US, too, President Trump is, is facing all sorts of problems in an election year. Is he going to have the time? No, I don't think so. And but, then, is that, but is that correct, though? Is no, it's correct? not. They, I mean, okay. human rights should be human rights. Human rights they, okay. they should address it anyway. Yeah. But the problem we've got is, you know, with this SARS pandemic and the collapse in oil prices, nobody wants our crude oil anymore. Nigeria is no longer really important to all these nations. So they're going to be, hey, we've got our own problems. We've got, yeah. you know, we've got post-COVID, we've got all sorts of other internal problems. Yeah. So sadly, yeah, we're on the back burner. The same question, Eddie, if you can, I'm asking you the same question as well. So um, what do you think about the international um, leaders and why they haven't actually said anything about what's happening in Nigeria? I saw a clip somewhere, someone was, asked, where it was interviewed, one of the top um, US officials yeah. were interviewed and they asked him, what, what, are the, what intervention are US going to offer? And he vehemently said it openly and said, well, it might be tough, but I'm going to say it. West Africa is not our priority at this moment. Wow. And that was his reply. And so that really shocked me. So we are not their priority. So um, we, we, were not, we shouldn't expect much, basically. We shouldn't. OK. For me, I just think that, you know, um, just like you stated, there's going to be a march in Downing Street in yeah. order to get the Prime Minister, you know, to be aware and, and, and say something and hopefully help with certain resources. Um, I think that's the right step to do because we really do need our leaders, the international leaders, to actually add to what's going on and, and, and that will give pressure to whatever that's happening in Nigeria and hopefully the right resources will be sent there and, we're, and, and, um, and um, in regards to helping SARS and, and, and changing certain systems 
you know, we need the international, you know, leaders to say something and be part of it, you know. And um, um, while talking about this, you know, can we um, can we pinpoint on any aspects, any addition that we can be able to say, like for instance, you're on TV and we've got like people that are going to be watching this and we've got the audiences that are going to be watching this. Tell um, the Nigerian, yeah. Yeah, tell the Nigerians basically just a little bit because we're going to go on a break on what you think uh, the government should really focus right now on. The British government? The, yeah, well, the Nigerian government. Yeah. Well, the Nigerian government has first of all got to resolve the issue of police pay and living conditions. Until that is resolved, this problem is going to keep being there. They then need to look at training. You, I mean, crowd control is not rocket science. Yeah. You understand? This notion of giving security forces live ammunition to disperse, to control a crowd, a demonstration, I don't get it. You know, in Europe there are protests every day and they're contained and they're controlled without any violence or bloodshed. So this is probably something they need to take up with the British government. What stops the Metropolitan Police coming into Nigeria and saying, okay, we're going to train you guys over a two-year period on crowd control techniques okay. that match international standards. You know, we'll give you the equipment, we'll give you the necessary training and guidance so you can do it properly. And then, you know, lastly, I love this also boils down to economics. Yeah. You know, I'm just, you look at Nigeria's budget of about 30 billion, it's not enough to sustain the country. Policing and security cost money. Nigeria's economy, we need to do something about that. The government has of to address course. that, or otherwise it won't be able to fund any of these programs. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're actually going to break right now. Um, my name is Nikki, uh, CEO of Nesting College. We're actually going on a break. Um, this is Centerpoint Africa. Please tune in um, as we carry on this conversation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. We were talking earlier in regards to SARS and NSARS, but we've actually finished that conversation, and what we stated was um, um, we wish that the Nigerian government will proceed and do the right thing in order to make sure that the um, NSARS become a, a jubilation for everybody. Um, but my panelists need to also introduce themselves in regards to the career and also the promotion of their personal business. I'll start with Chifayo, and Chifayo will start telling us about himself and, and his career. Chief, please. <laughs> Um, there's not really much to me. Um, I'm just essentially a journalist, writer, and author. I mean, I spent something like um, 20 years in business to business journalism. Then in 2000, and uh, after the Olymp just before the Olympics, in the London Olympics, yeah. 2012, it was decided we needed to uh, <coughs> launch a, a Nigerian newspaper in the UK, Nigerian Watch. So I was brought in as a founding editor. And um, yeah, we launched that, did well, uh, obviously had the usual challenges of funding, advertising, but it's still going. Um, other than my, than my media work, um, books is my other passion. I've published two books. The first one was Fueling the Delta Fires. Oh, you've got to tell us about that one. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about one, that book, yeah. The second one was Black Ladder. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so, yeah. The third one I'm planning to launch. Okay. To, published next year. It's just a compilation of all my thoughts. Okay. And I've called it, you know, uh, build, um, um, building a, an African economic giant, making Nigeria a $2 trillion economy. So I'm hoping wow. to get that out next year. Wow. Oh, so tell us nice. about your first... Um, Sorry? No? Your first um, novel. Oh, my first novel, Fuel in the Delta Fire. And that oh. came out in 2010. And um, it was basically a summary of what was going on in the Niger Delta. This was when the militancy was at its height. Yeah. And, um, you know, villages were being polluted. There were oil spills everywhere. People were hungry. There were no jobs for local people. Yeah, and, um, yeah, and they just basically delved into the issue, looked at it to say, look, government, you have to address these issues. Yeah. These poor people need sources of livelihood. How can they be sitting on these resources yeah. and they're still hungry? I mean, it just, I mean it's, we make so, we press the self-destruct button in Nigeria so many times. I sometimes wonder how we've even managed to survive. 
But anyway, that book came out and um, yeah, it did. It will, I mean, I suppose it didn't earn a lot of money, but at least it generated a lot of publicity and highlighted the issues a lot. Yeah, and then from there, you know, I've just continued. Wow. Mm. So um, what about then, how did you decide to do your second novel? About your first one, you did it in 2010, and then the second one, what's the name and what was it about? Well, the second one came out in 2017, Black Ladder. And because the first one was about Nigerians, I decided to make the second one about Nigerian diasporans. Yeah. And it was about Nigerians in the UK. And then the central character was a Nigerian migrant who came with nothing, started working McDonald's, and he worked his way up yeah. to become a city director in the city of London. And that was, that's why it was called Black Ladder, to show that black people can rise up the ladder if given the opportunity. Um, that actually fits more into the Black Lives Matter narrative, because a lot of black people in this country, yeah. if they're given the opportunity, they will excel. Yeah. We, we've seen it with a few examples around us. but. You know, we've come a long way. My mother used to tell me that in the 1960s, if you were looking for a house or a flat, you'd see signs, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Ooh, I mean, yeah, okay. And, and that was it. You were put down. You weren't allowed to rise. Mm -hmm. We've come a long way from there now. You know, we're not, we're, we're not in that kind of scenario. But still, there's still concrete ceilings. There's still glass ceilings that inhibits, our, you know, how high we can go. And so Black Ladder just highlighted all those issues and showed how, you know, once the doors were opened and people were given opportunities, they could excel. Okay. And Britain as a nation has got to accept that reality. You of know, course. we're no longer in the era of coal and steel and, you mm -hmm. know, your blue collar, traditional white English worker. We're a cosmopolitan society and the migrants have got a lot to give and you just have to accept that if you want to develop as a nation. Wow, thank you very much. Well, a detail boss, tell us about you and your business. I know you've been a, a pioneer when it comes to this, so please, I <laughs> want the details. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, basically, um, my main profession initially, I started with being, I'm a financial advisor, I'm still a financial advisor. Um, basically, I'm a broker, so we have, we are in, I have, I'm an intermediary to a lot of insurance companies in the United Kingdom. Um, these are Viva, Scottish Widow, Guy Venn, um, Royal London, Zurich, and so forth. So what we specialize in doing is to make sure that all people you know, are sorted out in their life cover, critical illness cover, income protection, building and contest insurance. Also, we also give mortgage advice as well, and especially the area of buy to left. So we help, I help my clients to do that sorted out. And that gave birth to several services, which I then expand to have my own branded business. So I've got okay. a perfume called <gasps> Self Esteem by Self, -esteem. By Self Boss. Oh, I need to say yeah. something here yeah. now. I've got a sample for you <laughs> in the oh, car. Yes. I'm so happy yeah, about this. So. Well, uh, before you go along here, yeah, I saw those pictures, but I didn't realize it was yours. Congratulations to Edith for doing this. I mean, you know, um, I need all the ladies to understand this. This is really, really good that you have your own perfume. Carry on. I don't yeah, so, you. <laughs> yeah, so I have my own perfume launched la yeah. uh, last month. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's called Self Esteem by Self Boss. Uh, so we have all, it's, it's, it's designer perfumes. Yeah. So instead of spending so much money on branded ones, so you can get the same similar fragrance from my one. It's wow. really nice and wow. they last long. So you have about 20% perfume on it with yeah. oil so yeah. it makes it to last longer so it's really nice so it's something that i'm working on so much to make sure that it gets so much visibility at the moment so we're building the website i mean it's going to be in amazon from wow. next week and so um, a lot of people before the first launch of the brand sold out wow yeah it sold out but i only sold that out on social media without having a website so but i had that tough job of going to the post office every time to post to client. <laughs> but now Amazon will be doing it for us. Wow. And then the website, you know, we have a free centers that are going to be taking those orders from him from the website. So that will less the, the busy aspect of that. So that's that's for me so far and what I've done. So so if anyone needs insurance <laughs> and they know me, they should just call me and I'll have 
I'll give them proper advice. Even if you have one already, yeah. I can actually review it for you to make sure that you, you, you're getting what you're paying for. Some people don't know their insurance is going or their life cover is going to basically expire very soon. Yeah. They think it's for life. They don't, yeah. they're not aware. So it's good for people to look into their policies to see when it's going to expire so that you know whether you're going to update it. Uh, so that's why review is very important. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you yeah. very much, um, Edith. Let's go back to Chief Ayo. Mm -hmm. You did a program about mm -hmm. Just last week, in regards to Nigeria at 60, I really want you to talk about that program because you know, <laughs> I know it was um, very elaborate. So tell us about that program, the Nigeria at 60, because we just Nigeria just turned 60. So I know it was a celebration. So yeah, tell well, us about it. It was on October 1st. Yes. Yes. And um, originally, when we started planning it last year before the SARS pandemic broke out. And what we actually had in mind was, let's have it at Chatham House. We'd actually spoken to some MPs. They were going to get us a room in the House of Commons. So what we wanted to do was, the first segment was going to be about Nigeria. We were going to get some dignitaries over from Nigeria to speak at Chatham House. Um, Ayo. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then um, on the following day in the House of mm -hmm. Commons, we were going to speak about issues that affect we Nigerians in the UK. Mm -hmm. Things like knife crime and you know all the, the domestic issues we face. So that was the program. Then we had the pandemic, and um, <laughs> <laughs> everything was uh, that. Yeah, just place. everything just went from like going up to all the way down. The uh, pandemic yeah, caused a lot of issues. <laughs> so what we decided was, okay, how do we do this? And mm -hmm. luckily, Yanga TV stepped in and said, "Yep, we'll happily broadcast it. Let's come to the studio, do everything in the studio, and we'll just broadcast it on Yanga TV." And that went out. I think was Channel One Eight Six on Sky. Mm -hmm. Brilliant three hour program, superb. We split it into three. The first was about economics mm -hmm. and you know, Nigeria's socioeconomic development. You know, the second was about diaspora affairs, and the third, which was arguably the most important one, yeah. was about the youth. We actually got young producers and young presenters, young speakers on there because that's it's a mistake we keep making in Nigeria. We do yeah. things and then we don't think about the young people, and then yeah. in 20 years' time, there's a vacuum. So what we decided was to bring the youth in. So next year, well, hopefully by next, this time, by October next year, all the restrictions will be lifted. When we go to Chatham House or the House of Commons, we'll actually have a youth session. And we'll call... Very vital. Yeah. We will call the youth and say, you know what? You organize your own speakers. You organize your own topics. People like you and me, Nikki, will just be in the crowd to clap and applaud for them. We are too old to participate in their... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, thank you very much, Ayo. Um, this question goes to um, Edit. Um, can I? I know you only do. You don't only do the your business. You're also within the perimeters of community development. So tell us about that, because I know you're in politics as well. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, you need to tell the viewers a bit, you know, a bit about that area about you. Okay, yeah, <laughs> so we, well, like I say, I do a bit of politics, right? Not like I do a bit of politics, because I have been once the chairperson of SDP, which is um, Social Democratic Party. So I was the first female chairperson in the UK, um, even the first chairperson in the whole UK because there was no chapter in the UK. So I basically pioneered this. It came and inaugurated us and we key started it. So that was a, my first step deep into politics of Nigeria. Yes. And that led me to go into community development. And so we have Servbus Foundation in Nigeria. So, wow. and what the foundation does is to empower young entrepreneurs. So, and we, I'm trying okay, to see okay, how we can. Okay, now, Eddie, how come you haven't said all this? <laughs> how, why are you keeping this from us? Uh -oh. You know, just tell so, us about that. Um, yeah, the self Foundation, like I said, we, we have kids started that in Nigeria. Yeah. So I started from my state, Abia State, basically. And so we I'm guiding a lot of young entrepreneurs. We know I grew up in a city in Abia State originally called Aba. And these are enterprise center of Nigeria. Yes, it is. We call it the China 
of Nigeria. <laughs> Nigeria. <laughs> so that that actually has helped me to you know. So what I do is I'm I'm gathering young entrepreneurs to show them how they can you know start early to have a side business irrespective of whatever they are doing. Yeah. And so I'm looking in future to see how I'm going to involve the Minister for Youth because our youth need to be empowered by way of funding. Of course. And that is where it's going to lead to. Yeah. yeah. That's well, basically how the, what the foundation is going to do for us. Oh, OK. Yeah. Thank you. And um, are you were talking about your, your SD, is it SDP? SDP sure. And then I think you're now what, what party, what political party are you now on? <laughs> yes. Really? Yeah, so what happened is when after the 2019 election, yeah, right, yeah. because um, SDP National endorsed the APC. Of course. Because um, we had a bit of hitches with the presidential candidate being in court. So when they looked around and we didn't have a presidential candidate, there's nothing less for them to do because they still have a court case than to endorse to you know to endorse one party to partner with it and that was how they partied on with the national union um, the national working committee of SDP decided yeah. to endorse APC mm -hmm. and then that gave us imp um, then that made me here in the UK for us to also partner with APC and so we kind of SDP and APC working together because the national working committee then which has mm -hmm. been dissolved now you know, and does um, APC. So right now, I'm also a member of APC Executive, which is, I'm a, one of the, uh, I'm their membership mobilization chairperson here in the okay. United Kingdom. So that was why when we started the issue, the discussion of SARS, and I said, um, it's a party that I support, that the girl everyone is looking up to, that it will ha that what happened you know, was just bizarre for us. Of we course. all condemned it in the forum. We've been getting in touch with the, uh, with, the, with Abuja. For way forward, we've been giving our advice on what they should do. Of course. We have notified them they need to speak. And they're gonna, we, we're expecting replies. OK, thank you. thank you, Adit. Now I go to Chief. Chief, I know you talked about your career, but you haven't talked about your political affiliations <laughs> and all the rest of it. So if you can actually tell us about your uh, party and uh, who you're supporting. <laughs> I've, I'm actually not a member of any political party, either in Nigeria or in the UK. I've just, I've, I mean... OK, okay so, OK, let's, let's start from this. Let's yeah. start from, uh, before, you know, let's start from Nigeria. So you're yeah. no, you're not um, APC, you're not PDP, PDP nobody, SDP... Nobody. No, nobody, OK. So, so how do you then get your point across, especially if you're not, if you doesn't, if you, you're not supporting anyone? Well, to be honest, what I've seen with the political parties is that people in the party don't actually get their points across. You know, most of the I know a lot of people who only join political parties because they want appointments and they want the, the trappings of office. Yeah. Now, one big problem I've got with Nigerian politics is that it's not about issues. It's not about policies. Now, my orientation, you know, yeah. as a historian, as a journalist, what I've been taught is that politics is you have left and right politics. It's about yeah. issues. Education policy, healthcare policy, transport policy, housing policy. You look at the you look at okay, just take the two main parties in Nigeria. Okay. Can anybody tell me the health policy of the APC and the health policy of the PDP? Can anybody <laughs> tell me their transport policy? Is is online. <laughs> is online. Okay. For yeah. every party has their policies and everything guiding them and if you go to their website you'll be able to read that. Okay, if I ask you, how many houses okay, let's take housing policy. How many houses is the APC committed to building annually in Nigeria as a party no. manifesto pledge? No, party sometimes do not put projects they can do for Nigeria rather than when they produce that candidate, the candidate will do those things for uh -huh. the, that they have promised they couldn't do. Uh -huh. But if, if you come to, when you come to UK, the system is different because parties will say the Conservative Party is going to do this. Yeah. They okay. don't personalize it to the, Thank you. the elected. Mm -hmm. So that is the difference, right? Exactly. But we go, we have strong manifestos that is guiding the party rather than the ones that are guiding the states yeah. or the country. Because I've seen some candidates in Nigeria who are barely coherent. You know, you speak to them about what are you doing and they barely have a clue about what they do. And, and I'm just thinking to myself, how do you work with people like this? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you then, you know, 
um, you, we talked about the Nigerian aspect, and then the UK one now. Mm -hmm. So no Labour Party, no Conservative <laughs> Party, you know, no Liberal Party. So which <laughs> which one are you leaning to? No, I've never. I mean, I'm, I'm in Bauritish. But you, but you do vote. Do you? Yeah, I do vote. I mean, so uh, is it the time that you choose? Because you have to choose a no, party no, no. to vote for. No, no, no. By orientation, I'm a socialist. You know? You're a socialist. Yeah, okay. I was yeah. born. So uh, then they say Labour. Yeah, I'm, I mean, uh -huh. I would always vote we, for we've Labour. We've got somewhere. No, but I'm not a member of the Labour. You party. might not be a member, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. But the yeah. problem is that you know um, we still vote. Uh, when we have to vote. Yeah, so. I will always vote so You always vote, yeah, yeah okay. that is where my okay. center of gravity so labor. Is. Yeah. yeah, okay. Your mm -hmm. Labour Party. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I, I'm actually not very consistent with who I vote for. Yeah. Yeah. It's when I hear them speak, whoever the leader, yeah. what the leader is telling us is yeah. what. So I supported Boris Johnson this time. I voted Conservative for the okay. first time. Yeah. And that was because of what the promises the leader came up with, right? Mm -hmm. And I was, I was a very supporter of Rare Exist. And because yeah. they, this is what Conservative believe, they wanted their exist. And I, I, I was happy with it. So, and that's why I voted conservative yeah. this period. That doesn't mean that next time it's going to be them. It could okay. be another party, yeah. depending on what they, you know, they bring on the table. On the table. That yeah. determines who I vote for. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. I need also to say just a couple of minutes. Well, we don't have a couple of just seconds. Please promote your business and tell people where they can find you. Okay. Well. Um, I have a Facebook page called Sevbos um, Sources, so there you can get all the information regarding our brand, which is the perfume. And also, um, I'm also on, well, we're going to be in Amazon next week, so that hasn't gone live yet. So um, when it comes to insurance aspects of it, the only way to find me is just to give me a ring on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I don't want to give my phone number on the national TV. <laughs> OK. But, yeah, so. Well, you got an email, yeah? Yeah, but I've got email that if you want to get in touch, my email address is edithconsorts at gmail.com. I repeat, edithconsorts at gmail.com. You can pop me an email for any query that you have and I will reply to you, okay? And I also was also help a lot of people then to give them advice. We give advices on loan. So if you need advice on loan, we, because we give both secure and unsecure loan. Yeah. So we do that as well. So if you need um, loan and need advice on secure and unsecure loan, you can pop me an email on editconsult at gmail.com. Dot com. Thank you. Chief Ayo, mm -hmm. seconds, anything you want to say to the audience in where to find you, you know, in regards to your book, you know, because you, you, you're a, a, a writer, so. Well, I just follow up from what Edith says. If yeah. you want to get a hold of me, the best place to try me is on my blog, okay. www.ayoakife.com. Every day, there's a daily column on it, and I also upload about five new stories a day on it. Yeah. Um, I also put details of my books there. Okay. Um, when my next book comes out, we may need to revamp the site because I'm trying to make this a mega project. We're looking at printing one million copies and distributing it around the whole of Nigeria wow. to re actually get to the core of our problems as a nation because we can't keep going on like this. We're, we're 200 million people. We've only got a GDP of 375 billion, a budget of about 30 billion. It's about one tenth of what we need. What we so need. Okay. The whole idea is to address that issue once and for all. Oh, well, thank you so much. The program is just finished. Thank you, Edith Self Boss, for coming. Thank I mean, you. I do appreciate you. And um, I'm happy about what you've actually introduced to us in regards to your advisor, insurance advisor, and also your perfume. You know, thank you so much for you know gracing this occasion with us. Thank you. And thank you, Chief Ayo Kanife, for coming. You know, it's been a pleasure to have you. You know, um, you're one of the pioneers that we listen to so um, thank you so much but welcome and thank you so much the program has already ended and um, this is Nikki CEO of Nasting College welcome to Centerpoint Africa with Nikki tune in every Thursday 3 to 4 p.m. and carrying we, we're carrying on progressing the program thank you so much <laughs>